Well, here I am at Liverpool Baha'i Centre with Carlo Schroeder. We're going to go in and look at the centre and we're going to chat to you about the Baha'i. Join us on Faith Matters. Faith Matters with me, Keith Hitchman. This is the show where we take a spiritual perspective on Merseyside life. And I'm here at uh, the Liverpool Baha'i Centre in Wavertree with Carlo Schroeder. That's right. Yeah. Um, who is a uh, representative of the Baha'i. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been great to be with you, Carlo. And uh, do tell us, um, you know, what is the Baha'i? I'm not sure many of our viewers really know. Yeah, thank you. I mean, first of all, welcome to the Baha'i Center. Um, not every town in, in, in the UK has a Baha'i Center, but we are in Liverpool, lucky enough, we have one. Uh, the Baha'i Faith is the youngest of the world religions, and it's, uh, it's, uh, the name comes from its founder, Baha'u'llah, who originated from Iran. So that's, the, that's just, in a nutshell, what the Baha'i Faith uh, stands for, or what it is. Yeah. Okay, and, um, you know, what are your beliefs? Baha'i belief that to, it's quite interesting to summarize a whole religion and beliefs, but if I, if I had to summarize the Baha'i faith, I would say these things. Baha'is believe in unity as a, as a main uh, principle, and that unity is that there is only one God, that there is only one religion, and that there's only one human race. But when we unpick that a little bit more, then I would also say that Baha'is believe uh, essentially in the life of the spirit. So we believe in God. We believe that God created us out of love. And that as human beings, we have that spiritual nature, of course, which comes from God. Then we see that, this, uh, that God would not leave us alone. He's always with us and he sends these uh, special beings. Uh, sometimes you might call them prophets. Others call them uh, messengers. Baha'is like to re refer to them as manifestations of God. And they're like a perfect mirror that reflects the sun, which is God. And in that mirror, we can see the sun. And in, in a given time period, a new manifestation of God appears. And so one, one at a time, as it were. One at a time. So yeah. when we look at these manifestations, I, just to give you some names, uh, let's say we have Abraham, Moses, Jesus, uh, or the Buddha, or Krishna as well. So we see that all these various faiths we see today are actually part of a progressive revelation where God speaks to us through these great teachers, manifestations of God, prophets, whatever name you want to uh, describe them with. And they appear at a given age and given time and teach mankind lessons that are important for this day and age. And we believe that Baha'u'llah is the latest of these great teachers, these manifestations of God, and the essential teachings of Baha'u'llah evolves all around unity of the world and the principles around unity in diversity. So, and I say diversity because it is, unity can only be truly come about if we have <laughs> unity and diversity. And there's a little quote from the Baha'i faith that uh, in the Baha'i writings it says that um, that which the Lord has ordained as the most mightiest instrument for the healing of the world is the union of all its people in one universal cause, one common faith. And that encapsulates that belief that we need to bring people together. Okay, and your founder um, mm -hmm. no longer with us? Um, in, in his earthly life? And in his earthly true? life, no. So Baha'u'llah the founder of the Baha'i Faith was born in 1817, okay. and the 12th of November 1817, and he was the son of um, a nobleman, of a minister of the king of Persia. And when his father passed away, he was in his early 20s, Baha'u'llah was given the opportunity to become a minister himself, but he chose to live a life 
of um, giving to the poor, as he said, he didn't he didn't want to have a political life. He wanted to say he wanted to pray and, and give to the poor, and he became uh, known as the father of the poor in his hometown in near Tehran, in what is now Iran, and he. Uh, he had a lot of suffering, and I think that is the story that Baha'u'llah tells about all the prophets, that yeah. he went through, for his beliefs, he was put in prison, then exiled from Iran, to first to Baghdad, in what is now Iraq, then to Turkey, and eventually he ended up uh, as a prisoner in the city of Akka, which is in North Israel, where he remained there as a prisoner for the rest of his life. And we be, to us as Baha'is, we believe that Baha'u'llah suffered these 40 years of imprisonment so that mankind can be released from its shackles. So it's, uh, th that his suffering was something important to us as Baha'is and that he did that so that the world can be transformed. And then he passed away uh, physically uh, in 1892 and that is now where Baha'is would, uh, when we pray, we actually uh, pray in that direction once uh, once to two, th two, once to three times a day, we actually turn to the direction of Akka to pray, uh, where Baha'u'llah is being buried. But of course, in some ways, Baha'u'llah as a spirit is not dead. <laughs> so, okay. if, because if the true life is the life of the spirit, which I mentioned early on, that life begins in this world with a, with a, in the womb of the mother, but then once uh, the body dies, the soul continues its way to God. Okay, and um, just, is, is there a, a manifestation alive today uh, of the Godhead, of the, mm -hmm. of the divine spirit, do you think? Uh, no, so it's quite, so the, what Baha'u'llah said is that it will, that these manifestations appear from time to time okay. in certain ages. It's not a continuous thing. It's not quite a continuous thing. It is, it is an eternal thing, but we expect the next manifestations of manifestation of God to appear in at least a thousand years from now, or maybe even later than that. So that's a promise of Baha'u'llah. And when we look at the history of what, how does Baha'u'llah relate to, in some ways, to other faiths, that Baha'is believe that there was always a promise in all faiths, that each faith would, would make a promise that someone would come to renew that faith, to bring more, uh, another message from God to mankind or to humanity. And at the moment, for us, this is Baha'u'llah, but in over a thousand years, we would expect the next one to come. In the meantime, Baha'is just have uh, Baha'u'llah appointed uh, his first his son as, a, as the interpreter of his writings, Abdul Baha, who Baha'is see as, as a perfect example of how to be a Baha'i. And then it's now given to the, uh, to the hands of the Baha'is to govern themselves um, within their, their structure. So, w when you meet together, mm -hmm. um, am I right in saying that you incorporate writings from a very Christian, uh, be sorry, very re varied religious traditions, or do you have your own writings, your own scriptures? We do have our own writings and scriptures. We have uh, the most holy book to Baha'is is called, it's an Arabic name, Kitab i Akdas, which means the most holy book, which has a lot of the Baha'i laws in it. But then there are estimated over a hundred volumes that Baha'u'llah wrote. So Baha'u'llah, uh, we believe that, that as Kof, this was his revelation from God. So God revealed through Baha'u'llah, like a hollow reed. So in Baha'u'llah, the writings were written down. And so we see those writings of Baha'u'llah as the very word of God, which is another Baha'i yeah. belief, an uh, important Baha'i belief. And so there are many books, but the most important one is the kitab i Akdas. Then there's a book called the kitab i Iran, which is the book of certitude. Uh, Baha'u'llah revealed the writings in Arabic and in Farsi, as he was uh, Persian origin, and then they got translated in uh, in nearly all the languages that there are. So, so w w what exactly do you do when you meet together? There are different types of meetings. So, let's describe one of the meetings, uh, which is part of the Baha'i calendar, the 19-day feast, which is very core to a community that has got no, more than nine Baha'is. And we come together as Baha'is every 19 days, which is based on the Baha'i calendar, where we have got 19 months, which 19 days, and at the first day of each month we come together, we share prayers from the Baha'i writings in that instance, 
we consult about the community affairs, and then we share some food, some refreshment together. So there is there's a spiritual side to it, a, so, uh, a, a consultation side, and then a social side as well. But then saying that there are many other meetings and, and activities that Baha'is do. So it's very important for Baha'is to study the, the Word of God, so the Baha'i writings together. So we have uh, groups of study circles where we learn uh, the writings together, where we develop skills of how to serve our, our community and our fellow man. We have got classes for children uh, to bring a moral education forward, classes for youth. And then devotional gatherings were actually, as you rightly pointed out, where we leave it quite open, where we say, well, if the true life is the life of the spirit, then one service element that we can do is to simply share that uh, spiritual life with others. And that means uh, that those devotional gatherings can take various shapes. Yeah. Well, I'm going to stop you there because we're going now to our commercial break. Um, when we come back, uh, we'll talk a bit about your personal story and then mm -hmm. delve more into the buff high faith. So jo join us after the break for Faith Matters. <laughs> Back to Faith Matters with me, Keith Hitchman. I'm at the Baha'i Centre in Wavertree in Liverpool with Carlo Schroeder. And we're talking about the Baha'i faith. So, Carlo, um, just want to talk about your story, really. You're mm. German. Mm -hmm. uh, you grew mm -hmm. up in East Germany. Um, were you born into a Baha'i family? How, how did you get involved mm. with this faith tradition? It's an interesting story because uh, you have to imagine that East Germany as a country was actually very atheist and the communist regime was not interested in religion at all. So I, when I was four uh, or, or so, I, I asked, my mom told us she believed in God. So my sister and I said, okay, we believe in God too. When I was six, I asked a question about Jesus. So my mom said to me, why don't you go to the Christian lessons in the local church where a priest had come to the village and some mothers just felt they wanted more religious um, education for their children rather than the communist style alone. And then my mother, when I was 10, discovered this uh, Baha'i faith just before the, the unification of Germany. And so she was actually one of the first East German Baha'is in the country. And she talked to me about the Baha'i faith. And what attracted me was this idea of the unity of religion, that all religion are essentially are from the same divine source, we don't quite know what that the source looks like exactly. It's, uh, you know, God is unknowable in this essence. But I like that, that explanation that all these religions are from God. And, uh, and when I was thinking, where do the one billion Muslims, okay, it was few, few, there were less Muslims at the time, population has grown since. But at the time, you know, as a 10, 11, 13 year old, you do think, so where do all these different religions fit in? Can it be that one is true, the other one is false? And I really like the message that they're all from the same God. And I, I, I enjoyed reading the Baha'i writings as well. And that, that were the sort of things that, that got me involved in the Baha'i faith. Another really important aspect was that my mom told me, as a Baha'i, we have to investigate the truth independently. So you're not going to be a Baha'i because your parents are a Baha'i. So when I was 17, I made that conscious decision. I could have made that decision with 15, which is the age of maturity, but I waited for another two years and I thought about it. How would I be as a Baha'i? I have to try to live to those Baha'i standards. And I realized you will always end up trying to live to the Baha'i standards. Like every other religious person, you always try to be a good person to the best of your abilities. And then when I was 17, I made that decision to be a Baha'i and to commit to the various practices that we do, the daily prayers and uh, fasting once a year and uh, attending 19-day feasts that we spoke of earlier. So I want to ask you the question, how does the Baha'i relate specifically to the Christian faith? What, what is your take on Jesus as a person? Mm -hmm. uh, and what did your founder and your leaders, what's their perspective on, on Jesus? Yeah. Very important. So I, I would describe myself, as I often say to my Christian friends, as a lover of Jesus. I, I feel that because uh, I, I, I was brought up in a, with the church and I feel I've never left Jesus because I, 
uh, I see Baha'u'llah, I alluded this to earlier in the interview where we talked about that to Baha'is, Baha'u'llah is, is a fulfillment of promises of previous religions. So to a Baha'i, the way we view the Baha'u'llah is that Baha'u'llah is that return of Jesus that is promised in the Bible, the, in the glory of the Father. And to us, that is what Baha'u'llah Baha resembles. And to me, I therefore, uh, Baha'u'llah warns us that we should not make any distinction between these prophets or manifestations of God. So when I look at Jesus or Baha'u'llah, I see them, they're all on, on this um, unique level. They're all in manifestations of God that are there to teach, uh, to teach mankind. And they're all part of, if you use a school analogy, they're all these teachers, they're, they're teaching a curriculum from God, who's got the master okay. plan. And just because one teacher has a curriculum to, to teach the ABC and another teacher has got the calculus, doesn't say anything about the teachers. It purely means that the audience at the time, 2000 years ago, wasn't quite ready for the same information, the same lesson plan that we needed for this day and age. And therefore, maybe Baha'u'llah's teachings go into more detail, specifically around the unity of the world, of how we can achieve that. Uh, what, what are the steps? That's the concern of the Baha'i faith. Where maybe, I mean, I, I'm not, um, maybe the, the emphasis, what I took away from, from Jesus was that to love thy neighbor. And obviously there, it's, so, it's so rich, there's so much that the Baha'i faith will build on, on the messages of, of Christianity. So to us, all these previous religions, a little bit like a Christian maybe see the Old Testament, okay. would build on what was previously. The Baha'i Baha faith wouldn't be here today if those previous religions, including Christianity, wouldn't have been there in the first place. Okay, and um, what about Islam? Because you said that Baha'u'llah was, was from Iran mm -hmm. uh, originally, Persia mm -hmm. originally. He suffered, mm -hmm. I assume he must have suffered under uh, an Islamic mm -hmm. kind of regime yeah. uh, and it, within an Islamic culture. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you relate to Islam in the, in the contemporary setting? The easiest way to, for me to explain it, I think, is to talk about, to look at that each time you have a mother religion and then a, a, a prophet comes out. So in Hinduism, you have a Buddha that emerges out of Hinduism. So you've got Buddhism, Hinduism. And maybe w another example of that is the Baha'i faith and Islam and Christianity and Judaism. So in some ways, you could compare it, if you like, just like Jesus was brought up as a Jew, uh, Baha'u'llah was brought up as a Muslim. And like Jesus, he found that the very people that he originated from were the ones that rejected him initially. And of course, some of them became Baha'is, uh, but there was, as the governments of the day were afraid of these new movements, uh, and they saw this as a political issue and tried to uh, imprison Baha'u'llah. Uh, many Baha'is were killed and persecuted, uh, even, even until today, of course. So that is our relationship, really. It's comparable to that, that we believe that Prophet Muhammad was, was a prophet from God, while we believe that the acts of the followers of Prophet Muhammad, two Baha'is, were the acts that were human-inspired rather than the core message of the faith when it originated. And so Baha'i would always look at the, at the origins of those early beliefs rather than at the man-made things that maybe come about a few thousand years later. Okay, um, uh, you've got a great emphasis on world peace. Mm -hmm. I know that. I, very basic question, simple answer, if you can give one. Um, <laughs> is, is world peace achievable? Yes, world peace is uh, achievable, it's inevitable. I believe that I'm as a person, as a Baha'i and as a, as a person, as a hu human being, I'm contributing to an ever advancing civilization. Once upon a time, we had uh, tribes, little tribes. We then developed into city-states. We got into nation-states. And at the moment, we are in our puberty. Humanity is in puberty. We are, we are, we, our body is quite strong. We, we have a lot of power now. Just the mind now needs to catch up and become more mature to deal with this newfound power that we, we can now connect the whole world. 
And so, to me, as Baha'u'llah says that the well-being of mankind, its peace and security are unattainable unless and until its unity is firmly established. And to me that means that we have to keep on working at that unity. Throughout centuries we've seen an ever greater level of unity throughout the world. We are heading there, but if we work with our neighbors, with everybody, with their little contributions they can make, to slowly, slowly shape a world that that becomes uh, comes more and more together less painfully, because that growing together, that globalization, can also be painful because it's it's a gro it's it's a growing pain. Okay, so very briefly, um, uh, very briefly, kind of, it, it, your founder's son actually landed in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. at some point and spoke to the Theoposcal Society here, is that right? That's right. He, he, when was that? That was in 1912 uh, and he spoke to Liverpool to the Theosophists, to the Unitarian I believe as well. And his message at the time was very simple to keep on warning people about uh, what could happen in, in Europe for instance. He actually foretold the First World War and he said to them to all these principles, he's, he shared principles of the equality of men and women, which is important for, for Baha'is, so that society cannot fly as a bird if you have got two unequal wings, they have to be equally strong. The importance of science and religions that are two knowledge systems that go hand in hand with each other. Great, I'm going to have to draw it to a close now. As always, we could talk on uh, for longer. Uh, maybe should, we should have a longer programme, I don't know, on Faith Matters. Um, but you can... People can get in touch with you here in Wave a Tree at the Baha'i Centre. Yes, and they can. join you here. Um, thank you very much for coming on the programme. Uh, thank thank you, you for viewing. And join us next time on Faith Matters. Well, here we are back in the studio at Bay TV. The place where Faith Matters began in November 2014. This is the very last episode. Many thanks for watching and a special thanks to all the team that produced it. A big thank you to all the faith communities across Merseyside for their contribution to the show. And many thanks to God, the reason why faith matters. Mm -hmm.